again, to, to suggest to us that preaching is dynamic and is always responding to the context that it finds itself in. Um, which, again, I, I think we have to be careful in that. That doesn't mean preaching can just be anything. Uh, but I do think that preaching has a very dynamic life in, in the history of the church that is constantly thinking about a couple of things. What is the gospel? How do we proclaim it? And who are the people we are proclaiming it to? And the, the reason the last one is important is because the context can change the way that it needs to be communicated, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those three things are really very important. And that's the thing that the church continues to wrestle with, even to today, right? So you have, um, oh my gosh, there's just a massive explosion that happens in the 1960s when we have sort of the new homiletic that pops up. Craig Craddock's kind of the voice that, he didn't start it, but he was kind of the, the seminal voice for a lot of people in terms of his communication of this new homiletical method. Eugene Lowry is another one, uh, Henry Mitchell, um, several people like that, uh, uh, Tom Long, um, oh, what is the other guy's name? Troger, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, several, several people like that. Um, from the 1960s, probably through really the 1990s, maybe 80s, 90s, uh, there, there's a sort of explosion that is a reaction to everything that's been happening in the Enlightenment period, and then uh, you have a, an explosion of new homiletical math method that happens in the 1960s and 1990s. Uh, you have a new wave of new homiletic that happens in the early 2000s up until uh, now. So. What, what's interesting is that you have these long swaths of history for the first, uh, you know, 17, 18, 1900 years of the church where homiletical method moves and changes very slowly um, because the culture itself is not changing very quickly. Uh, it takes a couple of hundred years for there to be significant kinds of changes in the cultures or society, uh, so you have a lot more stability. When you get to the 1900s, you all of a sudden have an explosion of technology. You have an explosion of like globalization, um, all those kinds of things. And so uh, you have you know the shift from modernism to postmodernism to whatever it is today. We don't really know what to call it. Um, and it's the the changes in culture begin to happen so much quicker, right? Um, well, you'll also notice that homiletical method has that same kind of reaction. So the 1960s, you have this sort of uh, revolution of preaching um, for about 30 years, this sort of like narrative theology and inductive theology and, uh, and preaching that's coming out of that has this really significant kind of shaping force. But then by the time you reach the 2000s, things are ch changing so rapidly, especially with the, the, the creation of like the Internet and social media and all that kind of stuff. You have this almost rapid uh, changing and shifting of homiletical method. So you have something like Theopoetics, which started in the 1960s, but has had this sort of like radical revolution that's happened in the last probably 10 years, um, which just sort of revolutionized or, or at least challenges some of the early uh, inductive narrative preaching styles. Um, so this is kind of what some of my work did. My work critiqued uh, Fred Craddock. Um, now, Fred Craddock was hugely influential in, in the way of shifting how I thought about preaching, um, but I've come back and critiqued some of his stuff. So that's kind of what homiletical method has been doing, increasingly so, in the last uh, really probably 20 to 30 years. Um, so all that to say, as culture is shifting and changing, you will see homiletical methods that are constantly shifting and changing. One thing I want to caution against is not just simply going with fads. So again, thinking about the deep theology that has undergirded hom homiletical and uh, sermonic kind of proclamation um, and what that looks like for today. So don't just simply be caught up in what's happening. Pay attention. There may be good reasons it's happening, but be willing to both engage and then critique. Um, so... Uh, for instance, you know, dialogical preaching has been sort of the new, uh, you know, kind of a new, uh, 
not necessarily fad, but it's a new kind of uh, field in homiletics that's been uh, growing more and more. Anna Florence Carter is a pretty significant voice in that, as well as others. Uh, o. Allen Wesley. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, anyway, some some significant voices that have uh, kind of gone in that direction. That that preaching is not a monological kind of thing. And the African American tradition has been doing this for centuries. By the way, um, they. But you know, in terms of like some of the academic pieces of that, um, it really hasn't been um, uh, written down in the same kind of way until probably the last ten years. So uh, Frank Thomas has been kind of part of that. There's others. Um, all that to say, uh, we need to think about the shifts that are happening in culture. We need to think about how homiletics uh, is both in conversation with that culture, but not just simply reacting to what the culture is doing, thinking about the long history of, of theology that undergirds our preaching, and then thinking about the homiletical method that best reflects that, that theology and what it is that we're actually trying to do for our people. Um, so uh, what, I'm, what I really want you to begin to do is Pay attention to what's happening in the culture. And in terms of homiletics, we'll talk about some of those new pieces. Um, but then I want you also to begin to think about when you're in a context where you're a pastor, whether it's a middle school pastor, chaplains, uh, you know, whatever it is, associate pastor, lead pastor. Um, what is happening in the life of the church? Uh, are, are you dealing with um, a culture that is is – uh, steeped in biblical knowledge, mm. that changes how you proclaim. Are you dealing with a culture that is largely ignorant of uh, biblical images and storylines? Mm. That that changes, that shifts how you communicate. Um, and so, let me give you an example here. If if I if I preached in um, some of the churches I've been in, so let's say Piedmont. Piedmont is a church I know really well. Uh, they have a deep, deep commitment to um, discipleship. They have a deep commitment to knowing scripture. In fact, uh, most of the teens, quite a few of the teens that were in my teen group probably knew the Bible far better than I ever did and probably still do because uh, they would they would memorize it. Um, and they, you know, they would win quizzing meets and all like national quizzing meets. They were mm -hmm. really good. Uh but that also reflected their parents' commitment um, to the life of the church and to their kids to disciple them. So I could drop a, a hint about other biblical texts in my sermon that were tangential to what the text was I was preaching on. Um, so I, I could talk about, uh, you know, Jeremiah and refer back to Deuteronomy without quoting that passage because they knew what Deuteronomy was doing. I could say, Hero Israel. And they would be able to understand that refers to the whole Shema and not just a small portion of it. If I did that to uh, the first congregation that I worked for, if I ever did that with my teens, most of them, it would have gone right over their head because they didn't know who Abraham and Moses were. They'd get them switched up. So I had to take a very different tactic by beginning to do some, some biblical education and storytelling that would help them to understand the context very differently than I would with a different congregation. Make sense? So all that to say, context, context, context is extremely important. If you want to be a good preacher, you have to have your feet in the soil of your congregation mm -hmm. to know what the, the pressing issues are mm -hmm. and how you're going to communicate to those pressing issues. This is what the life of the church has been doing all along. That's why homiletical theology, homiletics, preaching is not a secondary issue in the life of a congregation. Uh, we'll get into people like the Cappadocians um, who, who uh, give, ha have given us some of our, our greatest theology, systematic theology and the creeds and all that kind of stuff. But they were doing it through their preaching. I mean, they were preaching Trinitarian theology. And I'm not talking like... Um, Father, Son, and Spirit, that's it. I mean, they're going into like the Hamushia and all that kind of stuff, right? They're going in de like in depth with their congregation. Part of that, they could kind of do that with their context, but um, but all of this sort of theology that pours in was, was rooted in preaching. Uh, they were doing some really in depth discipleship with their people. Um, so I, I think this is the pattern of the church. 
considering what it is they're proclaiming. But that's not it. That's not, that's not the only piece of it. Content is, in more, it is important. What we're wrapping that content is equally important. And what we're trying to accomplish in the life of a con congregation for their edification is vitally important, and they're all connected. So we'll see that in the history of the church. Now, having said that, um, when you when you look at uh, the, the, we really have very little homiletical evidence, texts, documents for the early church. Now, I, I, you might say, well, what about scripture? Um, most of the things that are recorded that you know Peter preached or Jesus preached or whatever um, were probably a, a compilation of sermons. Um, you know, maybe the example that would be a little bit different is when Peter preaches at Pentecost, right? Um, but even that is not like a full-on sermon. Uh, we, we, it's really a snapshot, right? Um, people reflecting on what Peter said sometime after Peter said it. So they're not sitting there like stenographers writing down every word that Peter says. Luke is writing this sometime after for Theophilus as a reflection of the life of the church and its message. And he summarizes what Peter is saying in this sort of you know, uh, moment of proclamation to this group. But it's just a short summary snapshot. So even in that, we don't really get a homiletical like uh, form, you know, uh, form and structure. We we get this just small snippet. It'd be it'd be like um, it, it'd be like if I took a little uh, video clip of 30 seconds of what Becca preached this last Sunday, which was a tremendous sermon, and I can summarize it. But if you caught just a 30 second summary at the sort of conclusion of her sermon, you you've heard the sermon. But you haven't heard the sermon. Does that make sense? So that's what happens a lot in Scripture. Uh, even like, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus outlines the Beatitudes and all the kind of uh, pieces from Matthew 5 through 7. Um, those are really just kind of like snapshots of all these kinds of things Jesus has been preaching through the entirety of the, of the life of his ministry. So especially when you get into um, right after the Beatitudes, you have all these kind of choppy statements and stories and all that, and it's almost like it's been sort of piecemealed together. It, it makes sense because it's all sort of connected, but you can tell, like, this this is a, like all of a sudden a shift in thought really quick, and it jumps. Well, that, that indicates that there's probably something that was around that that made sense, but there was such a powerful image or a powerful metaphor that stuck with the disciples, and they said, this is really important, so they, they, they took a little snapshot. Mm -hmm. and. After, uh, you know, a few years after Jesus' death, when they're wanting to tell the community, this is the kind of people that we're called to be, this is who Jesus called us to be, they take all those snapshots, put it into a portfolio, and says, this is the kind of thing Jesus preached. Now, that doesn't mean it was one sermon, but this is sort of the, the trajectory of his preaching life and ministry. So we, we only catch these little short snippets of, of sermons in the, the, the sort of initial Jesus movement. And the same is true, really, for the life of the church in that first and early second century. We don't have a lot of, uh, there's, there's very little uh, documents. So um, we're, we're not sure how the church was conceiving of its preaching, but we can probably guess that uh, it's influenced by two factors. One is the synagogue and how rabbis would often sort of preach sermons. They're, they're, uh, their sermons were a little different than we might think of. Um, but they would have some some kind of homiletical element to their their time in worship together in the synagogue um, as a uh, a teaching piece for their members. Uh, the other piece is Greek rhetoric, um, because the the church in its sort of expanding role, especially um, right after the diaspora, when they get spread out all across the the empire. Um, and you have the lingua franca, the, the uh, basic language that is common along um, all of the empires is Greek language. A lot of the Roman citizens and Greek citizens would be trained in Greek rhetoric, especially if they were landowners or had money. Um, and some of the early Christians, as they uh, start becoming more influential, that Greek rhetoric piece will take on a, a much stronger life in preaching. But it has at least some initial... Um, influence in the life of preaching. So Paul is a great example of this, right? Uh, Paul, 
argues at the Are- Areopagus. Um, so, hey, I noticed you got a god out here. Uh, and he, he basically uses Greek rhetoric. Um, in fact, uh, one of his <laughs> one of his funniest arguments is, I didn't come with you, uh, you know, you know, to, uh, to you with wise words and uh, eloquent speech. And then he talks about all this sort of like eloquence. Um, he, he uses rhetoric to talk about his ineloquence. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <laughs> irony. Um, so there, there's some at least some initial Greek influence, especially for people like Paul, that would, may have had some dual citizenship kinds of opportunities for education. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some challenges with that because in the early church, the ones that tended to have that kind of opportunity for education were largely males, right? Um, so a lot of the early focus that we'll see will be sort of male-dominated, and so I, I apologize for that, um, but those are the documents that we, we have tended to have. So having said that, there were women that preached. Um, they often did not have the same sort of... Uh, either people that would record their sermons, like some of the Cappadocians, they had they had benefactors that are like, oh man, this is good stuff. Let's get Joe over here to take some notes while he's while he's speaking it. Um, and we'll get his basic sermon down. Uh, so we didn't have all that, that for everybody. And and they were bishops, so they had a little bit more, you know, elevated status. So, um, so there were women preachers, but it wasn't, they probably didn't get as many they didn't get all the press, um, unfortunately. Um, but having said that, we will get into, especially in the later history, where we see a lot more women preachers. That would be also one of the things that I challenge you for when you're doing the listening to sermons. I, I want you to listen to, to women voices as well. So if that's something that you haven't really been exposed to, you, you need to. Um, so that would be one thing that I want you to think about in terms of your diversity as well. All right. Um, so back to uh, back to the early church. Um, so there's there's essentially uh, in the ser- uh, synagogue sermons in air quotes uh, just because it's a little bit different. They had uh, essentially two types. Um, one is the proem, and it's essentially kind of the introduction of a speech. Uh, so it, it's often what they would do is it was very much tied to the text. So it's almost like a running commentary. Their their preaching style. Um, so this is this is rooted in the text. It's always coming back to the text. It's a running commentary of the text. It's sort of like midrash a little bit. Um, so they'll do sort of an introduction to the speech, um, and then what is introduced in this form is not the rest of the sermon, um, but a, a piece that's taken from the Torah. So the Torah becomes this lens by which they'll look at the other pieces that they're reading, whether that's the Psalms or the prophets or whoever. So the Psalms would, or excuse me, the, the Torah essentially is like the bumpers if you're in bulk. Um, this is going to keep you from falling off into the gutter either side. So they read that Torah text to say these are the kind of the boundaries for interpreting the text that we're going to be reading. So they would introduce it with that. So they say, here's essentially what we're going to be talking about based on Torah, and it's going to give us guidelines for understanding this text that may be uh, difficult to understand or is in a different sort of setting. Because everything for the Jewish life goes back to Torah, goes back to the teaching that God gave to Israel as a people that were brought out of Egypt so they would not become Egypt in their own in their own land, Right. So if you want to understand the prophets, you need to understand this delivery uh, that occurred in Egypt or or the, the second law getting in Deuteronomy or whatever it is. So like reading everything in light of the Torah, through the lens of the Torah? Yes, yeah. So it'd be something like if we read Paul and we're preaching out of uh, 1 Corinthians um, or Romans, difficult text, and Paul Paul is a complex guy. If you don't, if, if you read Paul without reading the Gospels, you will read Paul wrong. Uh, you have to read Paul in light of Jesus and the Gospels mm-hmm. in order to understand what Paul's doing. And the same thing with the Old Testament or the, the Hebrew Bible. Understanding that context will give you a, a much better idea of what Paul's trying to do. So if we were to preach Paul, uh, say out of Romans, uh, let's say 6, because that's always just a, a fun text. Um and we, we started the sermon not by reading Paul, but we read the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount to say, this is the bumpers that Jesus has given us to understand our life together. In light of this, 
Let's read Paul and understand what Paul's doing. That makes sense? So it gives context. Uh, so the, these, are, these are the things that will guide our life, and here's how we're going to sort of explicate that. Um, yeah, so the Torah and the passage that they read become this sort of dynamic conversation partners. This is actually a really fun way to preach, by the way. If you have a text that has often been understood in one way, um, and then you have a text that says something different, um, bringing those two into conversation and saying, um, this is not always just black and white. These are going to be our two texts that we wrestle with simultaneously. We're going to let them kind of spar it out. We're going to let them have conversation together. Um, trying to think. Uh, one of those, <laughs> one text that could be fun to do that is the text where David takes a census and one says, God told David to do it and he gets in trouble. And the other one in Chronicles says, uh, Satan tempted David to do it. So bring those into conversation and say, what do we do with this? <laughs> um, I think one of the things that it could do for, for a congregation is it, it indicates that the scriptural text is, it can be complex sometimes, and it's okay. We wrestle with this. Uh, we wrestle with the text. We let it, we let it jar us at times. Um, yeah, so I think there's some pieces that you could do that. You can do, it doesn't always have to be like in direct conflict. Um, it could be something that sort of speaks to the same sort of pieces, like uh, Deuteronomy uh, 6, the Shema, where it talks about binding um, on the hands and forehead, the, the law of the commandments, mm -hmm. and then reading Revelation where it talks about um, being branded on the hand or the forehead, uh, bringing those into dynamic conversation because – all, you know, the way that we tend to read Revelation has been um, kind of scare tactics, right? Uh, this is the mark of the beast. Well, if you put it in context for what's happening in Jewish life in Deuteronomy, that this is about living the commandments so that it's always by the things that we're doing with our hands and the things that we're thinking about and, and uh, dwelling upon, uh, that puts a different sort of perspective on it because um, it's connected with other texts. So it could, it could, shed light uh, on, on the Revelation passage or something like that. The, uh, the second one, um, this, this can actually be said two different ways. I'm not sure the exact pronunciation. I've, I've tried to find it, so I probably am going to butcher it. Uh, the Tanchuma, or uh, sometimes you'll see that C dropped in this Tanhuma. Um, so they'll, they begin with a very, it's very liturgical, and it'll begin by uh, sort of the introduction to the sermon is, let our rabbi teach us. <clears throat> so it's a posture of uh, receiving what the rabbi has been preparing. Um, it begins with a statement of the first verse or the first several words of, of the verse um, that they're pulling from their passage. Um, and then key words or phrases are explained, emphasized through the sermon. So this becomes almost sort of exegetical work, right, that you're doing in front of the congregation, um, which is really important for a community that often didn't have the ability to read or write um, and, and might have questions in terms of, like, uh, how these words are used. So uh, we do this in our own language as well, by the way. Um, if I use the word love, uh, it really depends on the context and what we, what we mean by that, by the emphasis of what. I love pizza. I love my wife. I love preaching. I love basketball. Did I mean the same thing by that word in every every sentence? I sure hope not. My wife would be very angry at me. Um, so words could mean slightly. They have a cloud of of meaning around particular words, and so they would they would sort of explicate that. What what I mean by this word, or what what seems to be indicated by this word. Uh, is this, and I back that up because it's, it says that in this passage, and it's used in this way in the same kind of context. Um, so they would they would help a congregation begin to understand what they're reading. Um, and in an oral tradition where they largely memorize text by hearing and reciting, uh, this could be really powerful because it, it takes on a deeper meaning as they engage that text. So, we, and again, we, we have a little bit of this. We do this with the Lord's Prayer. It'd be like me preaching on that and saying, um, you know, talking about uh, uh, trespasses or sins or however you 
uh, you know, talking about the translation difficulties of that. Um, so they would they bring that up. Um, so anyway, it's very exegetical in its style, um, going word by word, phrase by phrase, being very intentional about showing the entire meaning or possible meanings of a passage. Uh, so they talk about words and phrases from other other passages that might kind of give light uh, to the one they're dealing with. Uh, they also take other biblical verses and, and passages and sort of help uh, understand, um, you know, uh, so it'd be like when Paul quotes the, the, the Hebrew text, we might go back and read the Hebrew text of that passage in its whole so we can understand what Paul's saying and they go back to Paul. So they, they go back and forth. Uh, they talk about illustrations that were drawn from scripture and uh, or contemporary life. So they use illustrations. Uh, <clears throat> if you've ever listened to a Jew Jewish rabbi, a lot of times they have some of the just greatest metaphors and images. Uh, they're really gifted at, at taking complex ideas mm -hmm. um, and almost creating like uh, wisdom sayings. That's kind of what you could think of. It's like the wisdom tradition that they're handed down. They would use the <laughs> same kind of illustrations and stories. Uh, they would create powerful images that would help carry the text in the memories of their people. Because again, largely oral culture, and oral cultures uh, survive, they, they thrive on stories and images uh, to help what they're learning and to memorize and to, to continue to tell that tradition from time to time. Um, let's see. They would, <laughs> this is the kind of fun thing. So they, they would often be very playful with texts uh, that they were dealing with. We, we tend to think of um, very rigid meanings. Um, they, they would be pretty playful with it. And so you could have some pretty robust conversations between rabbis as to how that should be interpreted. And at the end of the day, they both kind of be like, yeah, that's, that's good. That's good work. Um, so, uh, so they would have conversations. They didn't always agree, um, but they would be playful with the text. Um, I think largely because of the way that the Hebrew text, or the, the language itself is not always just concrete. So for instance, a great word, ruach, right? It's playful. Could mean spirit, could mean breath, could mean wind, could mean all three simultaneously. Um, there, there's, there's playfulness to the language, the Hebrew language to some degree. And um, because most of us have been sort of influenced by Latin uh, in our language, um, Latin is much more rigorous. It's about definition. It's about concreteness and certainty of language. Not so with the Hebrew language. So again, they would play with that a little bit more than we, we tend to feel comfortable with that sometimes. So I'm going to do a practice in a little bit, uh, not today, but um, in the next coming weeks. We're going to do one that is going to help us play with the stories in the language. Um, again, exegetical work is important, but I want us to also think about it in imaginative kind, kinds of ways to engage the text on that kind of level and take us out of that headspace that's always just trying to figure out what is the one thing that this text is saying when it could be saying a lot of different things. Does that make sense? Um, and then they do a pretty, uh, pretty typical conclusion. They'd go back and summarize what they had essentially been talking about through that passage to, to give it kind of the kernel um, that they've been uh, emphasizing. So um, because of the, the uh, Christian life as part of the Jewish sect up until 80, the Council of Jamnia when they split, um, it was, it was considered a sect of, of Judaism. And so uh, I would imagine that a lot of influence initially came from there, um, especially its emphasis on the text, on, on reading and thinking through and breathing and immersing yourself in the life of that text and doing so in a way that, that the text itself became kind of the... Um, I'll use a Steve Green metaphor. He talks about being tethered. Mm -hmm. And a tether has a, a, an anchor point, but when you have that string that's drawn out from the tether, it can go a lot of different places as long as it's sort of rooted in one solid foundation. Um, so I think that's kind of what, what uh, the Jewish sermon helped us to do. It would stay rooted in the text, 
but there's a lot of flexibility in where that might be able to go. Some, maybe we would argue, are more faithful interpretations, some less. Um, but it's amazing. I've heard preachers within a short time frame preach the same text and preach very different sermons, very different messages, and both, I would say, were very faithful. Um, so, so, again, it's not about just finding the one kernel, uh, but context and all those kinds of things matter. All right. Do we need to stand up, shake again? We're good. Any questions so far on, on that first little section? Uh, uh, I, I know this stuff can be uh, a little wearing just thinking about history, but I really do think it's good stuff. Any questions? This PowerPoint, is this online? It's not. This is just some notes that I've been taking. I'm happy to share those, though, as we go along. Okay. These, are, these are notes I'm developing as well for myself. But again, this is, again, and again, I want to make sure that Edwards gets the, this is all his work. So I'm mainly just uh, summarizing what he's doing. So that's chapter one. <laughs> um, so the, the other influence is the Greco Roman influence. Um, We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but essentially the Greco-Roman um, rhetoric, what it's doing is not just simply teaching people how to talk. We often think of talking, you know, rhetoric as just talking or ways to talk or um, be uh, influence people. It is that, um, but, but kids were taught uh, rhetoric um, usually in their secondary education, Initially, their sort of initial education would be reading and writing, and that was about it. They might learn how to count a little bit, but it was very rudimentary kinds of education. They literally learned to read and write. That was the entirety of what they did in their early elementary education. The secondary education was about um, reading, especially poetry, um, because poetry, they said, summarized the ethos of their culture and community. Um, so rhetoric was more about enculturating people to be able to function as good citizens in their society. Um, so this, this Greek and Roman rhetoric was all about formation, and, and in particular, uh, moral formation. What does it mean to be a good citizen as a Greco-Roman citizen, whatever that, or wherever they were kind of at in that time frame? Um, <clears throat> so... The, the, the Christian patristics in, in particular uh, take that as a way of doing faith formation and cult enculturation of people, uh, especially those as the empire um, makes Christianity sort of the, the faith of the, the empire. Um, and that's already the language and style that people have been trained in. It becomes something that's very familiar. So I'm, when they're going through and, and uh, learning this Christian rhetoric, so to speak, um, in the minds of the people, they're already saying, I'm being enculturated. They know this. This is, this is what I'm, I'm learning, the language of the Christian faith and this particular, peculiar way of life. Um, so that was kind of the, the whole piece. So there, there's a very, the one thing that I think Greco-Roman uh, vocabulary does, it, it, it's, it gives us um, kind of a more concrete way of thinking about what we're doing when we're communicating. That's one of the things that was really helpful. So as preaching develops, especially with the beginning of Origen, but um, especially after him with the Cappadocians in particular, you have uh, more technical language for how to communicate and much more structured forms uh, that they utilize for communicating. Does that make sense? Um, so, Greek society did not have lawyers. So if you had a court case, you're on your own. <laughs> and so uh, if you were a common citizen, um, you know, from the very poorest to the, to the richest in the community, you had to defend yourself, which meant you had to be persuasive. You had to lay out your case <clears throat> in a way that would make sense, that could lay out all the facts and be persuasive, not only lay out the facts, you can't just lay out the facts, you have to persuade. You have to influence those that are making the decision to see your case from your point of view in such a way that they will take empathy or have pity on your, your case. So they'll rule in your favor. So 
early on when this the system is being developed, um, there's people that say, you know, I found this particular way works really well. So if you go with the, you know, to this judge, if you'll do this kind of tactic, you'll get good results. So they developed these little booklets of, of rhetoric, of, of ways of approaching the argument in court uh, that they pass around to people so that people can like kind of do a quick read. Um, like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I need to have a really strong introduction. Or, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I really need to create a, uh, an illustration here. And I need to create emotion here in this piece. Um, here I need to lay out the facts, all that kind of stuff. Um, so they have these these uh, these books that are developed uh, that begin to get increasingly technical about how to communicate in that, that culture. Um, Aristotle, in particular, was the the most influential, in suggesting that that rhetoric's purpose is ultimately about persuasion. So that's where the shift happens. Aristotle begins to say it's not just simply about education. Um, but it's also about persuasion. It's about getting things done in the community, right? Uh, so Aristotle uh, has a, a booklet that he puts out on, on rhetoric that has a huge impact, not only on the Greco-Roman world, but also on Christian uh, preaching and communication, uh, especially as they become more influential within the kind of empire. Um, so uh, starting with, you know, Clement, um, some of those uh, early leaders, they had some uh, training in that. <clears throat> um, so there's there's essentially three kinds of occasions that uh, public speaking or oratory would, would take place in, in Greco-Roman life. The law courts, as we were talking about, which is forensic, it's all about laying out the case, the facts, all that. Um, there's legislative assembly, which is deliberative. So um, our streets are all sorts of broken up, and uh, I don't know what kind of concrete you laid over there, but you need to get over there and fix my pothole, um, or or whatever it might be. Um, you know, so they would they would uh, have a very different style for talking to um, you know like the Senate or whatever those deliberative bodies. So it's not simply about laying down facts. There you have to be a little bit more winsome. <clears throat> the last one is uh, ceremonial events, so um, or epidictic. Uh, it's um, especially like if you were venerating somebody, or you're going to drag somebody through the mud. That happened too. So uh, they would they would like just heap on the uh, the insults. So the the more that you could either build somebody's uh, sort of image, especially like with the veneration of like a, a Caesar or something like that, or an important uh, member in the society, um, great orators could sort of like create this almost ethos, you know, kind of this mystical aspect to this person. Man, this person is just so good uh, that you would almost believe they're gods, you know. Um, so it, it becomes about this sort of like veneration, praise, or uh, if you wanted to humiliate somebody, an able, abled uh, rhetorician or orator um, could demean and sort of uh, cut out the feet of the person that they're going against. Um, so you might have things where it sounds like they're like sort of praising like, oh, the honorable so-and-so, uh, but really they're being very sarcastic. Uh, so you see this a lot more like in, um, if you watch the British Parliament, <laughs> They're really good at this. Uh, I just heard the honorable so-and-so who needs to be quiet and uh, stop making an idiot of himself. You know, they, they become, like, so cutting, but they do it in this, like, uh, witty sort of way. Um, so this is this is essentially what they would do in these ceremonial events. They would demonstrate wit, um, and this became, like, um, poetic, all those kinds of things. So those three kinds of events, which have very three very different styles of, of speaking. So same thing with preaching, right? If you're in a church service where things are, uh, you know, it's a celebration Sunday, okay, that's, a, that's one particular style. So when, when we preached this, like, well, Becca preached this last Sunday for our installation, um, she had an encouraging sermon because she knew that this was going to be a time of celebration it was time to be encouraging and to uplift and to uh, project hope about what the future might hold. Mm -hmm. If we're at a funeral, um, that is not necessarily the time to, uh, you know, um, 
uh, preach a, a sermon where you are uh, laying down the law, <laughs> so to speak, right? Um, th- there's that becomes a really damaging thing. So paying attention to the context that we're in and preaching is really important too. So even even in the uh, the moment of preaching, the the purpose might not change, but the style or the way that we're going about it does change depending on the. the the situation, right? So preaching has this as well. But it tends to still fall in these kinds of categories in some sense. Um, so for instance, if if I'm wanting to talk about one of those hot topic kinds of issues that, that you just know, as soon as you touch it, everybody's going to be up in arms. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It doesn't matter if people agree with you or disagree with you. Pastor, you shouldn't touch that. You shouldn't have said that. I can't believe you touched that. I can't believe you even addressed that. Um, we, we came here to hear about Jesus. We didn't come to hear about politics or whatever it is, right? Um, so there are certain hot topics. You know that as soon as you touch that thing, it is going to get lit. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> What kind of approach would you take? Would you create a highly emotive sermon? Would that be a good time to do emotive? Maybe not. Be careful with that, right? Uh, Because the emotion can go all sorts of ways. Would it be a time to do something that is maybe more like rooted in, in good research and facts? Laying out a case for a particular thing? Yeah, maybe so. Um, and again, there's different ways you can do that, so it doesn't have to be all about like building a court case, but 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 making sure it's rooted in good good facts, grounded in in good um, uh, you know good sources that people can look up and do some research and thinking about um, that can change it. Uh, so. Um, you know, I think David Busick did a really beautiful job when he was preaching through the Lord's uh, Prayer when I was a student here. Still a sermon I remember. He was talking about, give us this day our daily bread. You could do a very uh, a very powerful sermon in that way. Um, one of the things he did, though, that I thought was really beautiful, he talked about the facts about people who don't have bread. And many of us who have a surplus of bread. Mm-hmm. And the juxtaposition about this prayer that says, just give me enough so that others can have enough. So he, the way that he ended that was not by creating this argument like, I can't believe you guys have too much. I can't believe they have too little. You all are sinners. You know, he didn't do that. He laid out the facts and saying, here's where most of us live. We have a lot. Even when we don't think we have, we have a lot. And there's people that are suffering. And without giving us a resolution to say this is how we fix it or this is what you should do, he said, go in peace. I felt really uncomfortable. He told me, I I know where I landed in this camp. He didn't have to tell me where I landed. He told me what the problem was by the facts that he kind of laid out. I knew where I landed. I knew what the problem was, and I'm part of the problem. Uh, Without him being, you know, he didn't condemn us for that. And then saying, go in the peace of Christ, which sends me out as an ambassador to think about and re- and respond to this problem. How am I going to live that out? Um, it was a really powerful sermon. And that was, that was in 2012. And that was the sermon I heard seven years ago, and I still remember it because it was so impactful, the way that he set out the case and then kind of left it hanging without any sort of resolution because this is a problem that hasn't been resolved. Um, so you can be really creative about how you do those sorts of things. Um, they, so even in the preparation, the preparation, they have this whole system that they begin creating. So they, uh, we do this kind of with exegesis as well, right? Um, they do invention, which is figuring out what to say. What, what is it that I'm trying to communicate? Uh, what's the thread, the, the core? disposition so they begin outlining the speech i need to start here i need to do this to address this this uh, congregational block i need to um 
begin to state the problem right here. I need to give a resolution to the problem. I need to find a way of celebrating what the problem, how the problem has been resolved. Um, so for our, our case, how God has resolved it. By the way, that was Frank Thomas's method right there, right? So um, well, you don't know yet. Maybe if you haven't read it. Um, but I just essentially did the, the uh, uh, pieces of Frank Thomas's methodology right there. So they would take a method, whatever their outline would be, create that outline. Then they start thinking about the performative aspect of it. Style, should I do epidemic? Should I do uh, you know, forensic? Uh, what, what are those pieces that I need to do? Who am I addressing? Figures of sound. This is really important. I, uh, this is something I hadn't really considered as much before, but listening to especially African-American preaching, um, really great ones know how to use their voice and the sounds of words to create feeling, to create images. So, um, you know, they might do a really nice run about Sabbath. Sabbath is not just simply about rest. Hear how the rest? Mm -hmm. Draw it out. That S is soft. I didn't do a hard T. I did a soft T. Rest. That the way that was said creates kind of a sense of uh, if I said rest, that does not sound restful, right? Um, rest. So they have a way of thinking about how sounds come together. So if you read Genesis one, toe, 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 it sounds like somebody hitting a hammer working. Toe, toe, toe. The way it ends, very toe, right? And very good, very good. And then it's silence. Uh, it's rest. So uh, even, even in some of the way that you can look at passages, the way that words operate can create rhythms, sensations. Um, the, the sounds of words can create impressions. So if I want to do something that's really harsh, CK sound, right? Or if I want to do something that's a soft sound, like a PH or F sound, um, thinking about the kinds of words and why we're using them and sort of impression that we're wanting to create can have a huge impact. Um, and this just takes time and, and practice to figure out. Uh, but but go, listen, go listen to poets. Uh, poets do this really well. Um, go listen to them read their own poetry, especially like Maya Angelou. Uh, if you listen to her read her own poetry, um, rather than just reading it yourself, it, it's it's phenomenal. It just takes on a whole different life. I think sounds can do that. Uh, figures of thought, kind of the same way. You have to be careful, though, with figures of thought, figures of speech. Um, some things translate well if you know the culture really well. Um, so if you especially grew up in a particular culture and you're preaching in that culture, figures of thought uh, can, can work really well. They can also work against you uh, if uh, you're not careful, especially if you're in other cultures. It could mean something slightly different. So I'll tell a story about one of my friends. Uh, she goes to Ireland as a, a temporary missionary. First Sunday, service gets over. Everybody's going to eat at this gentleman's house. And she asks, um, because she doesn't have a car, she doesn't have transportation, um, can, I, can I get a ride? What she did not realize is that by asking, can I get a ride, she was propositioning it. This older gentleman in the church, he flushed bright red. He said, oh, dear, I don't think you know what you're asking for. He said, I think you want a lift. Just just one word um, that would seem to have the same kind of context, because they're both English speaking, right? Uh, but the context shifted the meaning of those words. Um, and sometimes you'll, you'll hit those and you just don't even recognize it. You, you learn. But you have to be really careful with figures of speech, especially if you're, you're preaching in... Um, if you're doing either your own, uh, like doing translation into a different language or uh, a very different cultural, ethnic context, you have to be really, really careful with that because that can get um, dangerous. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can be very disruptive in that regard. So just be aware. Uh, one of the things that you can do in that regard 
is if, if there's a preacher that is in that context, ask them about the context. Like, you know, um, ask them about their sort of uh, the way that they think and try to understand that, that culture as much as you can uh, in order to understand what things might or might not work. Um, so in other words, if I'm in rural Oklahoma, I'm probably not going to be talking about the stock exchange. It's not going to be a very helpful metaphor for many of them. Um, agriculture will be, though, right? So thinking about how, how images and all that kind of plays into it. And then here's the most impressive thing. So these people would orate for an hour, sometimes more. They would memorize their entire speech. It was not a good speech if you did not have it memorized. I won't ask you to necessarily do that. Um, but I think it is really important that if you are a manuscript preacher, or if you are a preacher that doesn't use manuscript, you are so familiar with that, um, that you're not dependent on a manuscript. You have a very clear sense of where you're going and how you're going to get there. Memorization is pretty important. I think it's especially important for your illustrations. Um, one of the ways that you can kind of get away from, or get away with using your manuscript without it being, feeling like you're so disconnected, is to know your stories that you're going to be using, so you never have to look down at the paper, ever. Uh, Becca, uh, as I mentioned, my wife, is a really great preacher, but she uses a manuscript every time, um, a very detailed manuscript. How she does it, I don't know. I, I don't understand it all the time because I just I struggle with that personally, um, but it works really well for her. One of the things that she does, though, she's run over it so many times by the time that Sunday morning comes along, she doesn't even really use it. Now, she might refer to it here and there, but even when she's sitting there um, using it, you can't even really tell that she's using it because she's so familiar with where she's at that all she has to do is just glance, see the word, and know what her next sort of move is going to be. Um, so... Again, being so familiar with that, and I know that won't happen every time life happens, funerals happen, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it, consistently, know, know your stuff, um, come prepared. Uh, so those will be one of the things that I'll, I'll ask. Uh, go through that several times before you come in and preach, just so you're familiar with where you're headed and how you're gonna get there. Um, and you're not so dependent on that. So um, you know, I had, I had the unfortunate experience of trying to do it on an iPad once and got locked out. And uh, that was not a good sermon. Uh, so those things, they, you can get bailed out, too. Um, another experience I had uh, early on in my preaching is I had a story that I, I thought I had memorized. It's a story I've known for a long time. And um, I didn't have any way of jogging my memory. Um, so I sat there for about a good three minutes before I remembered the sermon. Just that stood there at, at the pulpit. Um, if I could have my life choices and whether God had really called me to this. And um, hearing God say, welcome to a place of humility. Um, so I, I, I forgot that story. And then I remembered it and thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. I started to tell the story and forgot it again. So I sat there for another three minutes, agonizing, thinking uh, my life might be over at that point. Um, so <laughs> memorize that stuff. Uh, even if it's just doing like a bullet point, if you're not necessarily going to use a full manuscript, especially starting out when you're first getting going, um, have something that you can just quickly refer to. So we'll talk about some techniques later on, but just really be familiar, especially with your stories. Uh, that can create a lot of um, connection with your, your people. They also talk about uh, these three kinds of proofs that happen in the, the uh, speaking kind of moment with, with uh, an audience. So there's three ways that you can tell whether this is a good speech. Ethos, the trustworthiness, the authenticity, the, the uh, veracity of the speaker. Still true of preaching. Um, you, you probably know some preachers that they may sound really good on a Sunday, but you know a little bit too much about their life, uh, their personal life, that is contradictory to the kinds of things they're preaching, and you think, mm -hmm. this guy doesn't even, or gal does not even believe what they're saying. It's, it it's undermines their whole sermon, right? Um, so ethos is important, especially for a preacher. Uh, logos, we'll talk about this especially with Frank Thomas, logic, 
there's there's different kinds of logic, not not simply deductive logic, but there's even emotive logic. Um, so we'll talk about how those kind of interplay together. So can you can you create something that people can follow from the beginning to the end without them getting lost? Um, and that takes time thinking about how we develop. Uh, the last one is pathos, right? Emotion. Um, can you not only tell me something I need to know, but can you make me feel something that will shift not only my thinking, but my doing, uh, shift my being? Um, so thinking about things like the Surgeon General's warning that is on a pack of cigarettes, right? Great information, true. Uh, very few people read that and think I'm going to shift my life from smoking now because I've read this. Some might, uh, but most of the time, the thing that wakes them up, knowing that information is then the kind of emotive piece that comes along with either like a health scare or maybe seeing a loved one that is impacted negatively by that or who knows, you know, something that has gripped them that says, I've really got to change this and I need help. Um, so pathos is really important in the preaching moment as well, communication. Um, Cicero talked about uh, the orator's duties as to prove, to teach, to authenticate. Uh, what I would say, so kind of like probate, um, this is where we get the legislative or the, the legal language for probate. Um, this is really about presenting something to be considered uh, and doing so in a way that it can be considered in a holistic kind of way. Um, then it's to delight. Uh, so people should, should, in some sense, not be entertained, but they, they should be able to delight in um, preaching, speaking, thinking about these things, especially as Christian people. This should be delightful stuff. Uh, people should really come across uh, or come away from that saying, that was good. Um, and then the last one is to stir or to move. Uh, so again, kind of the pathos moment. So helping them to to fill the, the, the weight of something in such a way that they want to respond. Uh, we have to be careful with that because we don't want to be manipulative. There's there's a difference, uh, but I think there's I think good preachers um, are often the ones that can create such an emotional tie to this this text and what God's calling people to be and to do um, that it, they're not being manipulative, but they're really helping people to connect with the pathos of God in some sense, right? Um, so. Those, those kind of three pieces are the very things that Augustine will pick up on later and say that's the, the three pieces of preaching. Um, and that continues to sort of be what most people think of as good preaching. It's, it's about, um, you know, the, the ethos, pathos, and uh, logos, you know, the logic. Any questions so far? I know we're covering a lot of information. Is it making sense? Are you kind of seeing what why the developments are important, at least? Um, so they have, again, those kind of three pieces. There's three different kinds of, of communication uh, playing, which is for proof, for building a case, the middle for pleasure. So this is where they use like the flowering language or imagistic language. It's intended to delight. Um, it it uh, creates sensation. So if I were to say something like um, buttery popcorn, that may have just created a sensation. You may have smelled it. You may have thought about the butter that kind of just like causes the back of your mouth to water. You might have thought of like a movie theater. You might have thought about sitting down with your grandparents and watching a movie when you're little. Um, but the, the just a small image there created an impression. Um, that's that's what the middle was for pleasure to create a sensation to create connection. Um, and then the grand is for moving. Um, and so it aims at moving the audience to believe or do something in response. So these would build on each other. And again, we'll talk about different methods in terms of like form structures and how these kind of pieces work together uh, so that um, you're not just simply swaying over into emotionalism and you're not just sitting here in just the strict logic um, that, that can be really difficult to sort of trudge through for people. Um, how do you bring these both together in such a way that, that people walk away going, I heard a word of of the Lord today, and, and I want to respond in some way. Um, so they they had you know uh, some elements that they thought were really important, like you need to be grammatically correct. correct. Um, 
you might argue with that. Uh, for for your your manuscript, one thing I do want to say is don't write it for writing. Write it for speaking. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about what that can look like. Um, I'm not I'm not expecting great punctuation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but but do think about your how, how you're structuring it. But but write your manuscript for speaking. Uh, that's I think important. Um, they wanted to have clarity and expression and arrangement of ideas. That's really important still. Again, that comes to structure, form, um, matching style to content. So again, thinking about where are you at, who are you speaking with, uh, and then ornamentation with figures of sound, thought, to amplify what's said, uh, to give emphasis and distinction and maintain contact with the audience. Um, so, so sometimes why, why people kind of tune out is because we create, um, we sound like vacuums. I'll say it that way. Can I say it that way? Uh, or, or we sound like uh, helicopters or, or airplanes. We sort of have this rhythm where we drone and you, you, you create a sound that is always the same every time that you're, if you do that, it gets really boring to listen to somebody. Um, so the way that you begin to create interest in your, your speaking, anytime you're speaking, is by creating difference in what you're saying and pace and volume or silence or whatever. You create interest by doing all those kinds of things. Um, so it, it, this is something that they would teach early on. It, it's not just simply about getting content out there and getting it done, um, but you create interest by by creating distinct differences that match what you're trying to do in the preaching moment. So if I'm trying to create a, a sense of intensity, I might uh, become physically more tense as if I'm trying to create, like squeeze something. I, I might increase my volume. I might um, get more choppy with my language if I'm wanting to creates a sensation of slowing down and being more methodical. I might slow down, I might back up, um, lean back, open up. Um, so just being aware of different ways that you create interest both with your body, your voice, and the, and the language that you're using, the images and all that kind of stuff. So it all comes together. Um, and we'll get to watch some, some uh, fun preachers and different ways that they create interest. Pay close attention to that. Um, and so the last piece, they were, they were planned speeches rather than impromptu. They were expected to be given from memory. Uh, again, I don't expect you to do that um, necessarily, but I, I want you to be familiar with what you're doing. Um, so the oldest known sermon actually came from Justin Martyr, so mid-2nd century. Uh, on the day called Sunday, all who live in the cities or in the country gathered together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles of the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. And then when the reader is finished, the ruler in a discourse instructs and exhorts to the imitations of these good things. So that's kind of like the beginning of uh, at least our first sort of evidence of what preaching looked like um, in the early church. So uh, you, you can imagine somewhere between, uh, probably uh, somewhere close to 50 years after the Gospel of John was written, somewhere in the mid and second centuries, when they, they, they've obviously developed this for some time, uh, but this is sort of the first evidence that we have documentation of preaching happening and of what that was intended to be or do in the congregation. Um, so the second epistle of Clement to the Corinthians is the first, uh, the first sermon, mid-second century. Uh, so here's kind of the summary of what they do, uh, what he does. Um, God's gracious creative action in Christ on behalf is the first sort of move. So you can see it takes a large section from 1-1 one, one to 2-7. Uh, the response of acknowledging him indeed. 3, 1 through 4, 5. So it goes through this and, and then the very end piece, which I think is really uh, instructive for preaching even today. And I don't think that we always do this well. We do this sometimes in the worship service, perhaps, but not necessarily as part of the, uh, the homily or the, the sermon. This ends with the doxology. I will, I will make a case. I will contend that the purpose of preaching is not just simply to get people to do something. 
my contention will be that the, the end of a sermon is the doxology of God. Now, and doxology, I don't mean the song, you know, praise God for the blessing of well. That's fine if you want to do that. Appropriate way to end a sermon. Um, but it, it's about ultimately God is glorified through the proclamation of the word. God is the foundation and the telos of preaching. That's that's my contention. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't care how people respond. That's that's an important aspect that we consider. But the, the point is not to get people to do something. Um, and I, there'll be reasons I'll, I'll sort of talk about later on as to why that is. But um, I think this is really interesting. It, it ended with a doxology. Uh, so there's different ways that we can create this sense of praising God in the midst of a sermon. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about some different things that we could make implement, looking at other traditions, especially that have been that. Um, if you're part of the Nazarene tradition, um, you might, that might be kind of a difficult thing to, to think about because oftentimes it's, we, we tend to think more with our heads. That's how we sort of engage sermons, um, which creates some challenges for how you engage that with your congregation potentially. Uh, but we'll think about some different ways that you can do that, even with a congregation that might be more reserved and not necessarily vocal, verbal, in terms of the response to the sermon or something like that. Um, I have found I, I, there are ways to do that, uh, to help them participate in the sermon. So we'll, we'll talk some, about some pieces of that as well. Uh, so this is the doxology it would end with. Uh, to the only invisible God, the Father of truth, who sent forth to us the Savior and Prince of immortality, through whom he also made manifest to us truth and the life of heaven. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I think that's powerful. So uh, feel free to use it, but you don't have to. Uh, but it might be worthwhile. Uh, the, the second one, the second oldest known one, right around the same time, so kind of towards the last third of the second century, is Melito's Paschal Homily. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what a homily is versus like a sermon. Um, a homily is, is, uh, tends more towards like sort of the, the Jewish uh, sermon. Um, where they're sort of doing exegetical work on a text and, and talking about the words and their meaning and the phrases and other connections with scripture. Um, so a homily is essentially, it's kind of an exegetical commentary on the text uh, with illustrations and those pieces too as well. Um, so this Paschal homily uh, is the second oldest known. Um, Melito was a, a bishop of East, Eastern Asia Minor in the last third of the second century. Um, authored about 20 works that have been lost except for some fragments, and there's little that's really known about him. Um, it's it's liturgical in nature, and, and by liturgical I don't mean that it, the the high holy days of the church haven't really been developed as a church calendar per se yet. It's still being developed at this point, but liturgical in the sense that it has a particular rhythm to it that is... Um, it, it sort of kind of has a formal sound to it. Like there's there's some real intentionality. And it sounds like this is kind of like a song uh, in some ways. Uh, this is a song that maybe people would have known or something like that. So it, it sounds like something that has been almost um, ritualized. And by ritualized, I don't mean anything negative by that, but just it has a really nice kind of rhythm to it. We'll read a small frag piece of this. Uh, um it's not really reflective of the more developed Christian calendar, like I mentioned. Uh, it, the, the sermon celebrates everything from incarnation to Pentecost. Uh, so you, you think of some sermons that are so long. I mean, th this would have been, you know, a chunk of time talking about incarnation to Pentecost um, on this one day, this one holy day where he's preaching the Paschal. So um, it, it wouldn't have been Easter, you know, the, the Pas Paschal uh way we would have thought of it as where it's just talking about like uh, maybe the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, this would have been talking about the whole life of Christ, everything from infancy or maybe even going back to the, you know, John one, all the way to Christ has ascended, Christ will come. Um, it, it also reflects a second sophistic rhetorical style made popular under the Georgist uh, speaking styles of figures. 
um, you'll see that again kind of represented so uh, it, it kind of goes back and forth uh, with this rhetorical style so uh, I'll, I'll show you what I mean it might be easier to just read it so it deals with has a phrases or clauses that uh, with contrasting thoughts so it starts with something and then contrasts it immediately so it has a sort of bouncing back and forth that that uh, creates this really interesting dynamic, I think, really powerful. Um, and often, it's often of, of equal length. So if it says something in three or four words, the next line is going to be three or four words. So it, it has that same kind of feel to it. And then um, it often will have rhymes at the end of it. So you'll know that these clauses go together by based on how they sound. So it's poetic, it has rhythm, um, and then there's there's the fondness of, of sound play of all sorts that happens throughout it. So here's, here's part of Melito's hom homily. Uh, the scripture from the Hebrew Exodus has been read, and the words of the mystery have been plainly stated. How the sheep is sacrificed, and how the people is saved, and how Pharaoh is scourged from the mystery. Understand, therefore, beloved, how it is new and old, eternal and temporary, perishable and imperishable, mortal and and immortal, this mystery of the Pascha. Old as regards the law, but new as regards the word. Temporary as regards the model, eternal because of grace. Perishable because of the slaughter of the sheep. Imperishable because of the life of the Lord. Mortal because of the burial in the earth. Immortal because of the rising from the dead. You kind of hear the rhythm in it. Um, and so it, it goes back and forth. So mortal, immortal. Uh, perishable, imperishable. It has these, it kind of uh, has these bookends, right? Um, rhythm. Uh, so that's, it can be a really powerful thing in terms of memory and experience. And so it essentially shows these two characteristics that will be carried over into the patristics, especially when you get to the Cappadocians, um, but a little bit before that as well. Uh, it's going to be based on continuous exposition of the biblical text, as we might, it's definitely connected with how the, the Jewish synagogue preached. And it's going to utilize the techniques of the Greco-Roman rhetoric. Um, and out of that, the homily is going to take shape. And essentially, the homily will be what is the dominant form up until the high Middle Ages. Um, so this is a really long life period. Now, it, it shifts, it changes, it develops. Um, but essentially, the homily, the way that it's begin, beginning to develop from uh, the Jewish synagogue and Greco-Roman rhetoric, uh, is going to dominate the life of the church, um, essentially uh, up until the high Middle Ages. Um, so again, I talked about how now we're getting into that sort of rapid change. Um, but for the life of the church, there was this really long period of development of this particular method. And I think we'll learn some things as we talk about that method, about what that looks like and, and uh, how that plays out and and why they shaped it the way they did. Uh, that might give us some considerations for how we go about shaping our, our homiletical method, our, our sermons.